Okay, uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, I'd like to call this meeting of the Standing uh, Committee on Rules and Procedures to order. Uh, my name is uh, Kevin O'Reilly. I'm the MLA for Frame Lake and chair of the committee. Uh, today's uh, meeting is being live streamed on the Assembly's social media uh, channels to respect physical distancing requirements. Uh, other members and our witness, Dr. Nicole Good Goodman, uh, will be attending by video conference. So we have people in St. Catharines, Ontario, Tuktoyaktuk, Hay River, uh, Yellowknife, and Fort Simpson uh, on this uh, uh, video conference. Um, I'd like to remind all members and Dr. Goodman that all comments, questions, and remarks will need to be directed to myself as the chair. Uh, both members and the witness will need to wait to be recognized by the chair before speaking. Uh, our first order of uh, business is to open our meeting with a uh, prayer. I'd like to ask uh, MLA uh, Norn to uh, offer the prayer, if that's okay, uh, Mr. Norn. Is he frozen? Uh, Mr. Thompson, would you mind doing that? I think uh, Mr. Norn might be uh, frozen right now, so uh, if you would mind uh, uh, giving us the prayer, that would be great. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, dear God, thank us for this day as we work for the residents of the Northwest Territories. I'd like to thank you for having this opportunity to bring Mr. Mrs. Coleman to be present and give a presentation to us. Um, allow us to have listening ears and an open heart as we move forward for the betterment of the Northwest Territories. In Jesus' name, amen. Great, thank you, uh, Mr. Thompson. Um, our uh, next item is to review and adopt the uh, agenda uh, for this meeting. Uh, Mr. Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, today's agenda for committee is a one item agenda really um, with a public hearing with Dr. Nicole Goodman of Brock University. Following that, I'd recommend a quick in-camera wrap-up discussion from committee and um, that is all for the agenda today, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Mr. Clerk. Uh, are there any additions or changes to the agenda from uh, committee members? Not seeing or hearing any. Uh, um, can I get a motion to uh, approve the agenda as presented? Uh, Mr. Thompson, thank you. Uh, so the uh, motion, uh, or the, uh, there's been a motion to uh, adopt the agenda. The motion is in order. All those in favor? No objections. Uh, motion is carried. Thank you. Uh, having reviewed and adopted the agenda, are there any declarations of conflict of interest from anyone? Hearing none. Uh, we'll move on to our uh, first uh, public uh, matter. Um, perhaps I could just start by getting the, the committee members to uh, uh, introduce themselves uh, for the benefit of our uh, uh, guest here today, Dr. Nicole Goodman. So as I mentioned, my name is Kevin O'Reilly. I'm the MLA for Frame Lake. Uh, Mr. Norm, would you uh, introduce yourself, please? Oh, yes. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, morning. Uh, my name is uh, Steve Norn. I'm the MLA for the two near the river riding. Thanks, Mr. Norn. Um, Mr. Thompson, could you introduce yourself, please? Thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Shane Thompson. I'm the MLA for the Nehendi, which consists of six communities, um, kind of in the southwest uh, corner of the Northwest Territories. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Mr. Thompson. I, I believe we have uh, uh, Mr. Jacobson uh, joining us by phone. Jackie, can you hear us okay? And could you introduce yourself? Thanks. Yeah, good morning. Jackie Jacobson, Emily from New Nutput. Thanks, Mr. Jacobson. I believe we have Mr. Simpson on the phone as well. Uh, Rocky, can you introduce yourself, please? Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Rocky Simpson, MLA for Hay River South. Thank you. 
Great. Uh, thanks to everybody so, uh, for introducing themselves. And I'm joined in our uh, committee room at the Legislative Assembly by our uh, uh, researcher, uh, Mr. Stephen uh, Dunbar, and our committee clerk, um, Michael Ball. We have a clerk uh, interney with us as well, Mr. James Thomas. So uh, thanks to everybody for uh, making time today uh, to meet with us. Um, this meeting is the committee's third public hearing uh, in its public review of the report of the Chief Electoral Officer on the administration of the 2019 general election that was held here in the Northwest Territories. Um, we uh, intend to hold an additional public uh, meeting uh, later this month on September 21st during which members of the public will be able to make comments. And I just want to remind anybody who's watching uh, that uh, anyone can uh, uh, contact our clerk if they wish to make uh, a presentation or written submission uh, on any aspect of the last territorial election that was uh, held uh, on October 1st of last year. Uh, if you have any concerns, views, issues around that, you can please feel free to contact our clerk and we can arrange to uh, get a written submission or hear you in person on September 21st. Um, so I think uh, we've already introduced everybody. Uh, and uh, I guess I'll go now to our uh, presenter, Dr. Nicole Goodman, who's at uh, um, Brock University in St. Catharines, I understand, or perhaps you're at home. Uh, but thanks very much for joining us. And uh, I understand that you have uh, some comments, uh, suggestions for us uh, moving forward, perhaps with electronic voting. So the floor is yours. Please uh, go ahead, uh, Dr. Goodman. Thank you. Did you want, while they're setting it up, did you want me to start with like an introduction then? That would be great. Yeah, if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, uh, and yeah. I, I did have a chance to look at the paper that uh, you did with uh, Dr. Essex uh, earlier this year. And of course, we did hear from him. Uh, so yeah, sure, why not uh, uh, a little bit of an introduction while we get the technical stuff sorted out would be great. Thank you. Great. So yeah, thank you all for having me today. And thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so a little bit about me. So I'm an associate professor at, uh, at Brock University in St. Catharines. And I have been studying uh, voting technology, specifically online voting for um, a little over a decade. Um, I began uh, working with Elections Canada, uh, doing some assessments while I was doing my PhD. And I have since um, led or co-led several projects examining online voting, um, some at the municipal level, um, some with First Nations across the country, um, and then newer projects uh, looking at regulation, which I've been looking at with my colleague, Dr. Essex, who you heard from earlier this year. And so the presentation that I put together for you today kind of synthesizes um, really like many of the components of, of that research. Okay, great. All right. Thanks. I'm not going to touch anything. <laughs> All right. Uh, please let me know when it's okay to go ahead. Okay, great. All right, so uh, I have my screen up right now, my slides, so I, I'm not going to be able to see you, unfortunately. And um, hopefully, Michael will email you a copy of these, and um, you'll be able to kind of go through them, go through them with me. Um, all right, so thank you again. All right, so today I'm going to be speaking, or I'm going to be uh, presenting an overview of online voting. Um, and there's like a few different components to that. I'm going to speak a little bit about to the landscape of online voting, the effects on voters, the effects on candidates. Um, a little bit about regulation. I did um, observe most of the session with Dr. Essex, and I know that you had some questions about regulation, so hopefully, um, hopefully I'm able to address those for you um, today. Great. Okay, so electoral modernization is a trend that is occurring worldwide right now, um, particularly, of course, with the onset of COVID-19. There are a number of jurisdictions worldwide that are uh, exploring other ways to hold elections. Uh, you know, since the pandemic has hit, I believe it's over 61 countries have postponed um, or delayed their elections. Um, 
trying to come up with a plan and waiting to see what's going to happen. And in the short term, you know, this is okay, but over time, as we wait, um, it becomes not okay to sort of push uh, that democratic process further and further away. Um, so jurisdictions are using technology for a range uh, of items, including poll worker training, compilation of voters lists, casting of ballots, and counting of ballots. And I just want to make clear that online voting is sort of one piece of this modernization, but generally um, it's part of a much larger process. Um, and this is happening around the world, in North America, in Europe, Latin America, for instance. Um, the most popular reasons for the deployment of technology in elections, particularly particularly remote online voting, is improving trust in elections, mitigating fraud, uh, realizing efficiencies such as cost um, savings or more efficient and faster ballot tabulation, improving accessibility, and increasing turnout. Um, and there's sort of a common denominator here, and that's this idea of optimizing, innovating, um, you know, showing leadership, and actually strengthening, strengthening trust. So um, the next slide, uh, which you can't see, uh, just um, shows some of the logos of the projects that I have led or am co-leading. Um, and one of the projects is called the First Nations Digital Democracy Project. This project is with Dr. Chelsea Gable. She is an Indigenous scholar um, at McMaster University. And uh, I'm going to be speaking today more to the municipal side um, in the Canadian context in general. But I really uh, do think it would be prudent for the committee to, to hear about the effects on First Nations uh, and to hear from Dr. Gable um, on this issue, because I think, you know, given the context in the Northwest Territories, this would be, this would be really, really important. All right, so to begin, I'm going to talk a little bit about the landscape of online voting. So what is online voting? Um, there's different ways that online voting can be carried out. There is a polling place online voting, which would involve having machines at a polling location. This method offers election officials a little bit more control, uh, but it doesn't really add any convenience for the voter. The voter is still having to go out, the same opportunity cost to travel to the poll, um, and almost, you know, maybe it's even enhanced the opportunity cost because they have to then learn a new way of voting doing old sort of traditional procedures. Um, then there's kiosk internet voting, which is the, the middle picture. And kiosks are typically set up at centralized locations where people would normally frequent. Um, so this isn't necessarily a traditional poll, giving less control to election officials. But maybe it's at a supermarket, maybe it's at a town hall um, or a library, a central place where you know, it's not necessarily as accessible as voting from home, but it's more accessible than vis visiting a polling location. And then on the other end, we have remote online voting, which is the traditional um, type of voting that people take as being synonymous with online voting. And this is the kind of voting where you should be able to vote um, from abroad, from the comfort of your home. And this is really the type of online voting that has received a lot of attention since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, because this is the type of online voting that can, you know, enable uh, maintenance of social distancing while, um, you know, allowing people to vote from the comforts of their home. So, um, all all those types of internet voting and other types of electronic voting are used all around the world. Um, generally, we see that e-voting machines are a little bit more popular than online voting generally, but. Um, if you can see, there is a map and a number of countries, and then the next slide is a table, a uh, very detailed table that shows you all of the different trials that have taken place in countries around the world at different points in time. Um, so, I mean, some countries that have used online voting in include Armenia, Australia, Bulgaria, of course, Canada, Estonia, France, Mexico, Norway, Switzerland, the UK, and the USA. Now, it's important to point out that in many of these countries, uh, trials have been halted. In Norway, they were halted for security reasons. Um, France halted. In Switzerland, uh, it has been halted there, too, despite the fact that they had multiple programs running for security reasons. Uh, in the UK, they were halted because they felt that it didn't achieve desired turnout results. Uh, but there has been great success in other countries. Um, you know, until recently, Switzerland was seen as a real success story. Estonia is certainly a leader in online voting implementation. And we are, too, in Canada, actually. We have probably the most use of online voting um, than any other country in the world, just by a function of the number of municipalities in our country that are, are using that technology. 
So what does the landscape look like in Canada today? Well, you know we have it at the municipal level. Um, in Ontario and Nova Scotia, it is actively used. In the 2019 or 2018, sorry, um, Ontario municipal elections, uh, there was about 177 municipalities that used online voting, and there's about 414 that run elections. Um, and that number is expected to grow in the forthcoming 2022 elections. I think particularly we'll see that with pressures from, from COVID. There has been interest in other provinces. There was a, uh, several municipalities in BC that wanted to go ahead and municipalities in Alberta, but they have been prevented from doing so because they're required to get municipal permissions, uh, not, sorry, provincial permissions through the Municipal Elections Act to be able to go ahead. And, uh, and that was not the case um, for BC or Alberta. I can speak more to that in the Q&A. Um, there's also been a number of Indigenous communities that have used online voting uh, across the country. You know, um, some uh, Métis and Inuit communities have used it. Um, I have done a lot of work with Dr. Gable with First Nations across the country. And um, by our estimates, over 80 First Nations uh, have used online voting to ratify uh, legislation such as land codes, matrimonial royal property law, election codes, pass their own constitutions. Um, so they have really, really been embracing it uh, with a lot of success. Um, at the provincial level, we have seen some use. Elections PEI first used online voting for their um, plebiscite on electoral reform a few years ago. It was a non-binding plebiscite, I should mention. And then you folks um, used uh, online voting for absentee voters in, in your most recent election. And that was the first time it's been used subnationally in Canada in a binding election. So that's really, really remarkable. Um, at the federal level, there's been a lot of talk of using online voting. It was part of a strategic plan that Elections Canada put out way back in 2008, um, a long time ago. But we haven't seen any headway really on that. And then as many of you may have heard, um, the Special Committee on Electoral Reform considered online voting along with mandatory voting and electoral system change in 2016. And, of course, um, no changes were made there. Uh, it was deemed not to move forward based on security concerns at the time. Okay, so um, all of the activity that has happened in Canada provides us for a lot of policy learning. The idea of this a federal state um, provides many laboratories, let's say, for testing and trials. And um, the autonomy that municipalities have has meant that multiple approaches have been used and sort of a patchwork of development has taken shape. And this isn't really great in terms of having coherence across municipalities, which is one of the reasons why we need standards, um, but it's great in terms of learning for professors to look at these different adoption models and see the effects on how they work. Um, so I'm going to be speaking a little bit about that today. All right, so Canadian adoption. So why are municipalities using it and how they're adopting it? I'm going to speak briefly to that, and then I'm going to get into the effects on voters, um, the effects on candidates, and talking a little bit about regulation, and then take key takeaways. So why municipalities in Ontario uh, specifically are adopting it? That's sort of the hot spot of online voting use. Top three reasons. Accessibility, improvement in voter turnout, and convenience are the top three reasons across all municipalities. Why, why is this? Well, it's interesting that these three re rationales all speak really to increased turnout. In fact, the original reason that municipalities went ahead and started to implement online voting was because they had tried voting by mail. Some of them had even tried telephone voting with the goal of enhancing turnout, and they were not seeing desired successes. So they decided to opt uh, for online voting and see if it, if it changed things. Um, typically, those are some of the primary rationales for adoption, at least in a Canadian context. Now, I'm not sure if you can see this, but I have three charts that talk a little bit about how adoption takes place. And there are sort of three different components of this. So one is what I call the online voting period. And this is the period in which online voting is made available. So for example, online voting could be made available for advanced polls only. It could be made available for the full election. Then you have the voting process. Um, the voting process could be a one-step process, which means um, a voter would get a card to their home. It would provide them with a unique PIN or single or sign-on. They would be able to use the PIN and another type of credential to authenticate online. Uh, but two, a two-step process is another approach whereby electors are required to register to vote online first and then vote online. 
Um, and then you have the ballot types. So an election could offer only paper voting, for example, only internet voting, um, a combination of paper and internet voting, a combination of internet and telephone voting, a combination of internet, paper, and telephone voting, uh, or mail-in ballots. So there's a number of different ballot methods. Uh, and of course, the group of people that you make the method available to can also change things. So, I mean, in your case, previously making it available to absentee voters, you could make it available to specific segments of the electorate. In the case of COVID, for example, uh, some jurisdictions may consider making it available to people with immune deficiencies or pre-existing conditions that may make them more vulnerable to um, or more susceptible to COVID if they were to if they were to catch it. So what we have seen are sort of two policy learning patterns at the municipal level. Um, and the first for smaller municipalities is that we often see online voting offered for the full election. That means in the advance polls and on election day, we often see a one step process where they get the card, they go on, they vote you know, very quickly. So very low opportunity cost there. And we are often seeing paper voting eliminated. And so typically a fully online election, uh, sometimes it's internet only, but more frequently it's a combination of internet and telephone. And a lot of municipalities are using telephone voting um, because they have a perception that it better accommodates seniors, or perhaps they're located in a more rural area. Connectivity may be an issue and telephone is a see, uh, seen as a way of maybe broaching that connectivity. Larger municipalities, on the other hand, typically, but this doesn't always work like this, um, offer online voting in the advance period. Um, some of them are making the change. Markham, Ontario, which has sort of been a model case of online voting uh, in Ontario, uh, used the advanced approach for many years, except in the most recent election, they made it available for the full election. And I think many jurisdictions are sort of moving that way now. Um, a lot of larger municipalities rely on a two-step voting process, so they require the registration first. Um, this creates an additional step, which does mean that uptake is a little bit lower. But there is the perception among uh, certain individuals that maybe this enhances the security of the system a little bit. And then in terms of ballot types, we usually do not see telephone voting for the larger places, and it's usually a combination of uh, paper and Internet. So moving on, uh, voters. So who votes online and why? Um, so I have a, a chart here that compares paper voters and internet voters. And uh, what, it, what it shows you is that paper ballot voters are typically younger. Uh, the average age from the data that we collected paper, was uh, 44 years for a paper ballot voter and 53 years for an internet voter. Um, internet voters are a little bit more educated. Uh, they have an average education of some university, whereas paper ballot voters have an average education of completing uh, community college or some kind of technical college. Internet voters uh, are usually make more money. Uh, they have a higher annual household income. Um, and interestingly enough, um, paper ballot voters actually have a more committed voting history. So we will ask people about what's your voting history? How you know likely were you to vote in past elections? Did you vote all the time, some of the time, or not at all? And paper ballot voters are more likely to say that they would vote all the time, whereas internet voters are more likely to say they would vote some of the time. And what we see is that sometimes offering internet voting um, is an incentive for those infrequent voters to participate more regularly in the voting process. Um, so one of the myths out there is that if we introduce online voting, it is going to encourage young people to participate. And actually, the older people may be disenfranchised because they are not going to want to use online voting. And I want to put both of those myths to rest in my presentation today. So one, the data very clearly shows that young people are more inclined to vote by paper than they are by internet. I realize this may be counterintuitive. Um, these same findings have been detected in Norway, in the Netherlands, and many other countries. And what we think it is, is that one of the first voting experiences for these young people is it's an opportunity um, it's very symbolic. It's a rite of passage. It's a chance for them to, you know, experience the historic right of voting for the first time. And so they are more likely to visit a poll location and have that experience. Um, interestingly, by contrast, Older voters are more likely to vote online. They are actually uh, the biggest users of online voting, and uh, simply for reasons of convenience. Uh, while I'm sure there are some issues with digital literacy overall, uh, even for people that haven't really used the internet very much or may not even own a device, uh, it doesn't seem to be too much of a barrier in municipal studies. 
Um, okay, so if, if if you can't see the charts, I might just skip over this and uh, and get to why people are voting online. So the main reason why people are voting online is convenience. Certainly, accessibility is a factor, and it does enable accessibility for students who are away at university um, or school. They really appreciate online voting. Um, seniors who uh, travel because you know they're considered snowbirds and they like to go away in the winter. You know they really also appreciate this. People out of the country, um, people who are sick, people who are busy uh, with, you know, young children, for example, in all of these types of situations, um, there's a lot of appreciation for having this con- this convenience. So that's an important consideration when you're thinking about implementing it. Are you implementing it to bring voter convenience? Are you Im- implementing it for accessibility? Uh, and just know that convenience is often the main reason they're using it. We do find, though, that it does improve voter access uh, for all of the reasons that I've mentioned. You know, everyday life or health issues, mobility, travel, weather, illness. Um, Actually, we've done surveys of paper voters. So these are people who knew about online voting, but they made the choice to vote by paper. And we asked them, you know, we know you knew about online voting. You chose not to use it. Would you like to see online voting in a future election or are you opposed to it? And interestingly enough, 77% of those surveyed said that they want to see online voting. 16% said no way, they did not want it. So 30% of that 77% said they wanted to see it no matter what. They just weren't ready at this time to try it. They wanted others to try it out first, see how it evolved, but they would use it at a future date no matter what. But 47% said that they would want something like this in special circumstances. They preferred to vote vote by paper, but they recognized that there may be situations where getting to a poll may be challenging, and if online voting wasn't made available, they may otherwise be disenfranchised. And I think that's really important. Um, Okay, so next, implications for engagement. So, um, you know, a lot of you might be interested in turnout. I mentioned earlier that the UK canceled trials because they said that it didn't uh, have an effect on turnout or the desired effect on turnout. I can speak to that example a little bit more uh, in the comments. It wasn't very well carried out. But anecdotally, when we look at uh, turnout rates um, from implementation in in Canada at the municipal level, we do see increases, but we also see decreases. So in Markham, for example, in 2003, that was the first election they implemented it, they noted a 300% increase in turnout from that implementation. It's not a typo. (laughs) Then in 2006, they noted a further 43% increase. There was no change in 2010. Uh, Truro, for example, Truro is a great community in Nova Scotia. They have apparently the best fish and chips in Canada, according to the Globe and Mail. A small community, about 10,000 people, predominantly a a senior and elderly community, Um, and not great digital literacy. And they went all in. They eliminated paper voting and they um, used, uh, you know, fully uh, online election back in 2012. Um, I believe it was a combination of internet and telephone. And they noted a 140% increase uh, despite some of those barriers. So we wanted to look at this a little bit more systematically. So along with my colleague, uh, Dr. Leah Stokes, who's a professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara, We collected data uh, from Ontario municipalities going all the way back to 2000. We looked at five elections from 2000 to 2014. We collected the 2000 data so that we could have a baseline year before the voting reform was introduced um, to evaluate things. And what we found is that internet voting increases turnout by 3.5 percentage points, which is consistent with other convenience voting reforms. So mail voting, for example, usually has an effect uh, on turnout of about 2 to 4%. Um, what's interesting is that if a community, if a municipality did not have voting by mail in place beforehand, the increase was 7 percentage points. Now, Why this is so striking is because this increase is actually larger than much larger systemic change. So if we look at uh, what studies have shown us about changing the electoral system, so taking our current first-past-the-post electoral system and making it a a proportional representation system or something more proportionate, everyone's heard that debate, Um, most of that literature shows us that it's a a 5% Uh, percentage point change either way. So going from a single member plurality first past the post system to a proportional system, we see an increase of 5%, or if you go the other way, you see a decrease of 5%. So seeing that online voting, if mail voting was not offered in place beforehand, could actually deliver a larger increase for a a much smaller change was interesting. 
Now, that's not to say that this is the biggest increase. I mean, mail voting in some jurisdictions can, has been known to deliver an increase of 16%. But I think it's notable to say that this study proves that online voting does positively impact voter turnout, and in some cases, uh, by, by quite, quite a good amount. Now, that's a great benefit of online voting, but there are also um, you know, some potential pitfalls, uh, not even getting to the security side. So um, a study that I did with uh, some colleagues, uh, Michael McGregor from Ryerson, uh, Jerome Couture, and Sandra, uh, Sandra Bra, um, looks at um, the digital divide and whether people who uh, are in situations, sorry, where paper voting was eliminated, are we perhaps digitally disinfected? digitally disenfranchising some electors. And we do find preliminary evidence that in places where paper voting was totally cut, that some people are dropping out of the voting pool. And this is a concern. So you kind of have to balance it out and think, what, how can we implement this so that we can encourage those infrequent voters to participate more regularly so we can see a turnout increase. But on the other hand, so we're not disenfranchising people who may be left out because they have weaker access or weaker digital literacy. So that's really, really important. So what does this mean for local elections in terms of participation? Well, it means that um, online voting is not a silver bullet, but uh, it could be the best structural reform we have that, you know, is sort of a, a lower hanging fruit reform to deliver an impact. Um, the effects should not be discounted as marginal. We know that it can increase in the municipal study. It increased the effective voting population by 7%, potentially changing the results in 10% of mayoral races. Uh, that would be if internet voting preferences differed. Uh, it can affect election outcomes if there's a close race between candidates. And uh, just for consideration uh, for you folks, outcomes may be different at higher levels of government. So some studies have shown that, you know, when you look at voting by mail, for example, there was a 2% increase uh, in turnout. But then when you implement voting by mail at the subnational level, there's no increase. The increases uh, sometimes for voting reform seem to be felt more strongly at the local level. So that's just important to note. In terms of considerations for the policy design, when there is no registration requirement, we found that 35% more people voted by internet. So there would be greater uptake in that instance. 9% um, less people used it when it was available for advanced voting only. So greater uptake if it's offered for the full election period. When paper voting is eliminated, there was still an increase in turnout uh, of two percentage points, uh, but I'm not advocating for this uh, approach, and I think that we really need to take the early evidence of uh, disenfranchisement based on digital literacy to heart. So those are some of the impacts on voters. Uh, in terms of candidates, there has been less research. Um, there is some early research that shows that it can change the nature of the campaign. Online voting, if you make it available in advance, it typically gets more people out participating at different times. Advanced voting in general has been increasing around the world. You know, over the past 20 years, we've seen unprecedented increases in advanced voting. And what this says to me is that people want more choice and convenience in their voting today. Um, so if they're voting sooner, candidates are having to change up their, their campaign strategies and approach because when they're knocking door to door and canvassing, they're encountering many more voters who have already cast a ballot. Um, it's making the front end of the campaign a lot more important. Uh, another interesting th uh, item is that candidates don't seem to have a good sense of who votes online. There's a study that we're currently uh, working on that's not, not published yet, but it will be going out soon, um, that sh asks candidates you know, who they typically think votes, uh, votes online and then comparing that to who does vote online, and they don't have a good assessment of that. So that's interesting and something we'll explore further. Uh, and then finally, in candidate surveys that we've done, we find that candidates, you know, even if they're not thrilled about online voting, they're willing to embrace it because of its convenience for, for, the, for the voter. So regulation. Regulation is uh, really important. I'm not going to go through all my points here because you can't see the slides, but I was going to speak a little bit about uh, the types of approaches that are used. Um, you know, Switzerland has a particular approach. The United States has a particular approach. Uh, Europe, uh, through the Council of Europe, there's an approach that's used there. Happy to speak to that in the Q&A. Um, I'm sure all of you saw that in the paper that Dr. Essex sent. So just to be really, really brief, we have no regulation in Canada. Uh, this is a big problem. Um, 
It's been great that municipalities have had the freedom to implement online voting the way that they see fit. But like I mentioned, it has sort of developed this patchwork, this hodgepodge of different approaches. And I mean, this isn't to say that some municipalities aren't nailing it and getting it right. You know, some municipalities are very, very thorough and robust in terms of the bylaws that they're they're, they're passing. But um, at least in Ontario, the Municipal Elections Act does not really provide um, cover for electronic voting or really cover unsupervised voting. And so this has allowed a lot of stuff to go on (laughs) um, that maybe should be regulated. And so both Alex and myself have been working together to really push for regulation. Um, And, you know, we've written a paper where we devised a model for how this could work. And we are actually working um, with stakeholders right now to write early standards that we hope will be in place uh, in a year. So I'm happy to speak to that a little bit more in the in the Q&A. But um, generally, we look at these three different types of approaches. So the United States, uh, which focuses more on hardware and certification, and they have what we call a prescriptive approach, um, where they have everything sort of outlined right down to every nitty gritty detail, like the type of pen that you can use or can't use. Um, so very, very prescriptive, very specific, um, certification, hardware, and voluntary standards. So not mandatory. Um, in Switzerland, for example, the standards are mandatory and they're based on different levels of use. So as the usership increases, the standards become more stringent. Now the Swiss, um, option compared to the U S is more focused on software as a certification as opposed to hardware. Um, And these are just specific technical standards around the reliability and safety of online voting. Switzerland's interesting because it is a federation like Canada, Um, but it's a a top-down approach, meaning it's being really led from the the national government uh, in concert with with the cantons, with the sub-national governments. Um, And we don't um, necessarily have the political will nationally to have that same approach in Canada right now. And then finally, in Europe, we see more of a broad-based approach. So the Council of Europe is an organization, international organization with 47 member states, and they have put together voluntary standards or recommendations, uh, two iterations of this, um, to provide sort of wide applicability for member and non-member nations. Of course, it has to be broad, right? And it can't be too specific if it needs to apply to 47 countries. So in Canada, um, you know, how would this work in Canada? We don't want something too broad. They already have something pretty broad now and it doesn't seem to be working. Um, we don't want to be super prescriptive like the U.S. I feel like this is like the three bears in the porch. You know, you don't want the porch too hot. You don't want the porch too cold. You want it just right. So we've kind of developed this new, uh, put forward this new idea for a model in Canada, which would, there has to be some top-down component to it, but the municipalities would have to be involved and it could be administered locally. So our vision for this is mandatory technical standards. Um, Our goal is to build these standards out for Ontario first as a case study trial it, um, you know, for the RFP release for the 2022 elections. And then from there, evaluate, uh, you know, go back to the drawing board, talk to stakeholders, and eventually come up with a national framework. Um, In addition to the mandatory technical standards, we feel it's really, really important to have voluntary procurement and operational guidelines. Um, So a document that we can provide municipalities with to say, listen, these are key questions that you need to be asking vendors to ensure that you're protected. Um, And then, of course, a renewed legal framework is needed. That wouldn't be us. Uh, That would be an updating of the Municipal Elections Act uh, or any other necessary uh, legislation. But, um, yes, this could go a long way to help boost technical knowledge and capacity in communities, enhance electoral integrity, and empower communities across the country, let them know how to vet vendors, which questions to ask, and help them to build public trust in elections so that there aren't hiccups like there have been in the past two, actually, municipal elections. So um, this is really, really crucial. And I think it's especially important now with COVID uh, and all of the fallout from that, knowing that, you know, this may be the way we have to go. Look at how much more our society has had to depend on technology in the past six months. And I'm sure that in many cases, technology is going to help us get through elections so we can continue to, you know, um, enable people with their right to vote, uh, ensure that we're having regular, democratic, uh, free and fair elections, which are so, so crucial. But 
we need to be willing to put in the work. We need to be willing to put in the research, the funding um, to support this. We can't just all of a sudden say we're going to do it and have it happen. So um, implications for electoral democracy, just to close, um, and some advice. So definitely, I think there's increased pressure as use becomes more and more widespread. And I think this pressure has even been um, a little bit more more uh, severe since since COVID came along. I think that they're in Canada, if you look at the attitudinal data, there's a lot of public favoritism for this technology, more so than other countries. And this is likely to continue to grow um, unless there is a documented case where an election is declared, declared illegitimate. I mean, even in um, the 2018 example, I can speak more to this in the Q&A, there was an, ins an instance, uh, I think Alex might have spoken about this, where um, a number of municipalities, I think it was 43 municipalities, had a elections slow down, people weren't able to vote, you know, they had to declare a state of emergency in some cases, and people had to vote, they had to extend voting for a full day. Um, we were actually doing a survey at that time, so we have data from, um, attitudinal data from people who voted before the hiccup and people who voted after, and is there a difference in satisfaction? Absolutely, but it's not the type of difference you would expect that um, would create this cancel culture that people are saying, oh, we wouldn't use online voting, um, and so that maybe is a little bit of a concern. So the public in Canada seems pretty open to this technology and willing to accept some risk. Um, election authorities like yourself, uh, like legislatures uh, and like yourselves have to walk a delicate balance um, between using the latest technology and acting in the public interest while maintaining the integrity of the election. So sometimes you can't just give the public exactly what they want, um, but maybe it's not best to just, you know, be as traditional as uh, a lot of governments have been before. So there has to be a balance struck there. We need, we absolutely need research into online voting and other election technologies. It is crucial. We are not doing enough in this country. Um, um, we are not going to be in a position where we can full-fledged implement this technology uh, without hiccups unless we start doing, even if we start doing the research now. Um, the best way to success is slow testing, consultation, and an evaluation of, you know, electoral modernization, including guidelines. I'd like to think of approaching electoral modernization as a process. So you're looking at the forest, not the trees. You're not just looking at online voting as one tree, but you're looking at this as a process, a forest, and how are you going to implement this modernization? Um, some more implications. So retaining current voters is important. Um, you need to keep the ones that you have, and it's also important to try and, you know, recruit new ones. But if you're not retaining those who are already there, um, voting levels could drop. And uh, offering online voting seems to be a key tool in, in retaining voters. So, so one question to ask yourselves is, is technology a necessary tool to maintain current voting levels? Um, institutional change is important, but it's not the sole solution to engage voters, even new technology. So please don't ever think that introducing some, te some tech here, there, and, and there is going to fix elections. It's not. Elections is really about people. Um, technology can help, but it's never going to be a panacea. Turnout. There's a modest positive effect on turnout unclear if this is just at the community level. So to summarize, online voting, I would say, is not a replacement for paper voting at this time, uh, based on the digital literacy findings that we have. And we're just sort of scratching the surface of this. There's a lot more studies to come. Um, moving forward, I think we really need to develop policy around this and baseline standards. And Dr. Essex and I are trying to lead the way there. Um, and generally, I think people are frustrated today with electoral institutions. But that doesn't mean, again, that technology is the answer. The solution is with is with the people. So thank you very much. I hope you found that informative, informative and I look forward to your questions. Uh, great. Uh, thanks so much for putting this uh, presentation together. We've, we've got it uh, with your uh, notes as well. And um, I did read the paper that you did with uh, Dr. Essex before the, the meeting, and I can see that you've summarized parts of it here uh, very nicely for us. Um, I, I would add that we have great fish and chips here too. <laughs> uh, you got to come up to Yellowknife sometime and try Bullocks. And then in uh, Inuvik, there's a great place called Alistine's. And I'm sure Rocky could tell us about great places in uh, Hay River as well. But um, no, thanks very much for your uh, presentation. I think it's uh, helpful as we move forward with consideration of e voting. Um, I'm going to open up the. Uh, uh, to my colleagues, though, to see if uh, any of them uh, have any questions to, to get us started. Uh, I can see Mr. Norn, and I know that we have uh, Mr. Thompson 
and uh, Mr. Jacobson and Mr. Simpson uh, with us as well. A any questions from any of the committee members? Okay, I'm gonna start with one. Um, you mentioned that you're starting to do some work with uh, Dr. Essex on um, standards and um, I noticed, noticed that there was a kind of like a couple of professional or level organizations or um, groups that you mentioned in your, your paper uh, um, that might be interested in doing this work. Can you tell us something about how far along that is uh, and uh, who's involved and engaged in it? Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you for the question, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, yeah, so we have really just sort of scratched the surface and we've begun. Uh, we are in the process of getting ethics approval from um, investigators who are, are part of the, the team from different universities. Um, and we are working to write a standards proposal that is going to go to an organization called the CIO Strategy Council. Um, who will then be forming uh, focus groups and assisting with, with the writing of standards. Um, and as I understand it, uh, we hope it will be a, a fairly quick process, uh, of course, fairly quick in the creation of standards, um, so maybe about a year. But, yeah, we're hoping in about a year's time that we will have some standards to provide with communities. And along with these standards, we're hoping to uh, draft with our Ph.D. student and Dr. Essex um, kind of a, an operational guide to elections that would provide governments with sort of, look, at these are the key questions that you need to be asking. Uh, these are the protections that you need to be putting in place. Um, if you want to be thinking about a contingency plan in case of a problem, these are the things you need to consider. One of the things that we saw in the 2018 election um, after there was the technical slowdown is that a lot of clerks weren't sort of prepared for this and there was very awkward press conferences and we don't want to see that type of thing happen. Um, so we want people to be prepared uh, regardless of, uh, you know, the rationale for the technical malfunction. In the case of municipalities, there's been one in 2014 and one in 2018. And in both cases, it wasn't the internet voting technology. It was um, a different type of technology that had to do with human error <laughs> in both instances. But the broad public doesn't know that, and it can make uh, the technology look like it's not working and can lower public trust in the technology and election. Great, uh, thanks. Uh, can you just tell me what the CIO is? Thanks. Yes, okay. I'm just going to get, yes, so the CIO uh, Strategy Council is um, an organization in Canada um, whose goal I'm going to pull it up here, is to uh, help sort of uh, develop standards um, around innovation and, and new technology. Um, I'm happy to send you a link that provides a little bit more um, uh, around their work, but they are here to sort of support the Canadian ICT ecosystem, and they have helped to foster standard creation in a number of, in the area of IT in a number of industries. Great. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Um, uh, we might be in touch with you to follow up on that, but no, that, that sounds really uh, interesting. I, I understand that uh, Mr. Thompson, uh, who's uh, on the, the video conference from Fort Simpson, uh, you have uh, some questions for Dr. Ben Goodman. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Goodman uh, for this presentation. <clears throat> so my, my first question is, I, I'm, I appreciate the presentation. Um, did you look at how we did our online uh, voting um, as going through it? That would be my first question. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I did look a little bit at, at the online voting. Um, unfortunately, I think your election happened after my injury, so I wasn't really able to... Um, I don't know if I was reading at the time or not, uh, but I, I haven't delved as deeply into it as I would like to, but I hope to do that. I've just recently started back at work a few weeks ago, actually. Thanks, uh, Dr. Goodman. Uh, Mr. Thompson? Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, I look forward to uh, hearing back from you on what you think of it. Um, I, I, I was looking at your slide here, and I apologize. I've got it on my phone. 
Um, so, and it just does black out on me here. Um, so, when we talked about Canada and, uh, and you talked about municipal governments, um, has there been a reason why you think that we haven't seen uh, provincial jurisdictions actually run, um, allowing uh, online voting as part of their uh, election process? Thank you. Thanks, uh, Mr. Thompson. Uh, uh, Dr. Goodman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the member for the question. Uh, yeah, I think there's a. I think. The rationale behind it is multifactorial. I mean, some of it has to do with security. So um, as you increase the level of government, the possible perceived risk of the election and perhaps the stakes of the election can often be perceived as increasing. Um, and so you have to take that into account. So I definitely think risk, security, uh, but also there's more voters for implementation. Um, I do think, however, that we will start to see it more now, uh, particularly given the COVID pandemic. Um, and this is why, I mean, I've been saying this for years, that we, we need to do more research into this because we can't be in a situation where one day, you know, there's an international, there's a global pandemic and we need to use online voting and we can't just all jump in with both feet and say, let's go do online voting. You can't do, adopt technology like that and have successful outcomes and have, you know, robust security. It needs to be an investment that is a continual investment. Um, governments, jurisdictions need to be boosting their IT infrastructure, learning, working with researchers such as myself and Dr. Essex. And we're not seeing that happening enough in Canada like it is in other countries. Great. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Goodman. Uh, Mr. Thompson, uh, any further questions? Yeah, just a couple more, Mr. Chair. Um, so my next question is, uh, well, actually, it's uh, actually probably a third question. I'll go to the third question after, with your permission. Um, but my first question is, is the recounts and the challenges that we see with paper, you can actually see the vis, what the person's intent was, or you can see where the accounts are. And if you're in a close riding, the numbers of uh, recount of uh, spoiled ballots um, could be the difference between an individual getting elected or not getting elected. And so how does online voting, because I know when we heard our last uh, presenter, Previously, you know, that was one of the challenges that we see. So, how do you feel that we can address this uh, moving forward? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Thompson. Yeah, and I, I can add too, uh, I won my uh, riding in the last election by 11 votes, and there was, I guess, some concern raised by the other candidate around. Uh, E-voting uh, in my writing, but uh, um, Dr. Goodman, please go ahead. Uh, great, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the member for the question. Uh, so, just to clarify, you're wondering how, like, what do we do in situations where it's a close race? Right? How do we provide that sort of transparency and accountability to show people they can trust the technology? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Great. Yeah, so uh, certainly this is a you know an issue that uh, that has come up before, um, and you know my understanding is that usually they will, uh, if it's very contentious, they would you know do a, a te technical recount. Um, yes, you don't have the paper copy, although now there are some companies that are offering paper co copies and still doing online technology in Canada. Um, New Boat is, is one of those companies. Um, but I mean, there, I, I've heard stories working with polls where there would be, you know, um, uh, people would be, it would be wet and cold at night and people would just take the ballot back boxes back to their homes and put them in their basements um, and leave them there and not count them, um, forgetting them. There was one community that I worked with where there, every year there was a guy who would come and take two ballot boxes and run and, and jump in the lake with them. <laughs> so, um, and anyways, I share this just to say that there can be issues either way, but um, I think 
how you get around that is you have to be really transparent. You have to have good outreach. You have to have good education and communication. And you start to engage stakeholders and all stakeholders early on. Who are those stakeholders? Well, voters for one candidates, the media, um, and you want to start to reach out to people, you know, educate them, make them feel like they're part of the process. They'll be less likely to, uh, you know, go against you then. And it's really a, just a, a more open and transparent process. Um, and you may not be up to the same same type of challenges as you would otherwise. But that is to say that they can easily do a recount um, and provided there was no tampering, it would be probably more exact than a, than a paper count. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Goodman. I, I know, Ms. Thompson, that you may have one or two more questions. I've got a couple of other members on my list, so uh, we'll come back to you if that's okay. Uh, next, I have uh, um, Emily Norn. Um, please go ahead. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you for that uh, presentation, uh, Dr. Goodman. Um, so I was listening to uh, to the presentation, and one of the themes I got out of this was that electronic voting, uh, I think, overall is just meant to be a supplementary measure, um, from what I'm hearing. Um, I guess my, my main question is, uh, throughout your um, research, um, did you see any trends elsewhere where electronic vote, voting kind of uh, was used uh, where there was a spike in usage. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, uh, uh, Mr. Norn. Uh, Dr. Goodman, please go ahead. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to, uh, to the member, Mr. Norn, for the question. Uh, yes, yeah, so I guess... Um, I mean, it would be up to the jurisdiction. Uh, I'm not saying that anyone's making any wrong decisions necessarily, but um, I would not recommend, you know, abolishing paper voting and just moving to an all online, all online election at this time uh, for a number of reasons, uh, some that have to do with security and some that just have to do with general accessibility. Um, and, you know, I think it's our job to try and make elections as accessible um, as possible. And um, we can do this by, you know, enabling multi-channel voting. Um, in terms of, you know, trends and making voting easier. Um, we definitely see that young people prefer paper voting, but young people who are maybe away at a university have really appreciated the option to vote online and have used it. Um, and we do see, you know, higher usership among elderly people. Now, there's a certain point where that does drop off. Uh, there's a certain point where, you know, maybe they prefer, prefer paper voting or they're just not voting as much. But, um, you know, we see that if you look at the, the charts, over 50 um, is the group that's predominantly voting online. So I, th I think that's really interesting in, in Ontario. The numbers are different for European countries. Okay, thanks, uh, Dr. Goodman. Uh, uh, Mr. Norn, I'll let you go ahead with another one, and then I, I'll go to Jackie Jacobson. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you for that uh, response. Um, one other thing that really, really struck me through all this, too, was I kept going back to uh, some of our vulnerable populations that vote, like um, for elders, for example, that uh, don't um, speak English, where English is not necessarily, or French for that matter, is not their second language. Then uh, this kind of overarching kind of issues with uh, First Nation elections, I know that uh, we have those a lot all over the, like, the, all over the country. And, and if you look at a voters list from any, any set First Nation, they don't necessarily live in that community. Um, you might have somebody say, for example, uh, in my writing, we have the community of uh, communities of Futsuke, Dainukwa, Dendilo, and when they each each of those communities that have their elections, they don't uh, maybe only a portion of their uh, population live there, and they could have their uh, their electors all over the country, um, and they they might have some trouble getting voting. Do you think there is? Um, you, can you see a trend in them, uh, that moving in that direction where you'll see more First Nations holding electronic uh, voting? Um, I don't know what that looked like in terms of uh, there might be some capacity building that needs to be done, but um, what is your opinions on that? Thank you. Thanks, uh, um, Mr. Norton. Uh, Dr. Goodman, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the member for the question. Yes. Uh, so um, definitely, you know, and I, again, I would say I would suggest to the committee to 
speak to Dr. Gable to, to hear more about this, but um, in the communities that we've worked with, we have seen it be a huge help um, in terms of increasing off-reserve uh, participation. Um, and, and we see this also with municipalities offering online voting increases uh, the participation of seasonal voters, people who maybe own property there but aren't there necessarily all year. Um, we've Some of the communities we've worked with, Wasoxing First Nation uh, by Perry Sound, Whitefish River First Nation, uh, Sutina Nation um, out in Alberta. And um, I mean, they've all used online voting for uh, different types of things. Uh, the Mohawk Council of the Akwesasne, too, also, they used online voting um, uh, to ratify some of their legislation. Now, the important thing to keep in mind here for First Nations is uh, I mentioned how municipalities are sort of tied by the Provincial Elections Acts. Well, First Nations are tied depending on how their elections are governed. So some First Nations will be under the Indian Act still for their elections. Some First Nations will be under the First Nations Elections Act, and then some will have their own custom codes um, where, you know, they are in charge of their own elections and can run them as they see fit. And currently, um, if they are under the Indian Act or the First Nations Elections Act, they cannot use online voting for an election or for referendums. It's not provided for in the referendum regs. Um, Dr. Gable and I have written a report, actually, that we hope will be coming out shortly where we have staunchly recommended that these regulations, community-based report working with communities across the country where we staunchly recommend that uh, these regs need to be amended and need to be amended ASAP um, to allow for this. But some of the communities that do fall under the Indian Act or First Nations Elections Act still have used online voting for other types of votes, such as uh, the land code. Um, there was uh, a participation threshold on land codes, for example, which, which has since been changed, but it used to be that you needed to um, meet a certain participation threshold to pass your land code. And to do that, if you have a community where you have 25% of your community living on, on the, the community land and 75% living off reserve, and you need to get 25% to pass the land code, yeah, you need full participation, which can be challenging, right? So, so online voting um, has been used by, uh, by communities as a tool in a number of cases to pass things beyond referendums and elections, different types of ratification votes, such as matrimonial real property or land codes. Um, maybe I'm speaking too much here, but yeah, there, there's a lot. There's a lot there. Again, those regulations, they really need to be changed. But communities, um, they're really... Uh, for the most part, enjoying their experiences with online voting, and they're finding that it's enhancing sort of their path to self-determination. Great. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Goodman. Um, uh, Mr. Norton, I'm going to move on to uh, Jackie Jacobson. If you have any other questions, we, we can get you back onto the uh, list. Uh, Mr. Jacobson, uh, I understand you'd like to ask some questions. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. No, just in regards to uh, going back to the capacities for the internet for the small communities, that uh, is pretty pretty shoddy as of uh, as of now. I mean, we're working towards getting better internet service providers into our communities, but our returning officers, uh, that how does that work in regards to uh, the capacity? Like if our territorial government is going to provide better service to our communities prior to doing something like this because our communities are um, that need uh, need better service. So that's just a question. Does it come into this report? And like second question, the returning officers um, in the territory, I think, uh, are really professional at what they're doing in regards. They don't run, jump in the lake. I think that they. Uh, they, as soon as the thing um, election is done, they once it's counted in that they, they they're locked up into their office and they handle themselves accordingly in regards to that and to if it has to force a recount. So, internet's the biggest thing, and is a, is it a code per person? Like, and that's the thing for voter fraud. That's just the question that I have. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Dr. Thanks, uh, uh Ms. Jakes, yeah, those are great questions around training of uh, returning officers and uh, internet access, which is very poor for many of our smaller communities. So, uh, Dr. Goodman, please go ahead. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you to the member, uh, Mr. Jacobson, for the for the question. Um, definitely, uh, building technical capacity in rural, uh, remote communities, northern communities, is is a, is a big challenge. Um, it's something that we that we need to work on together. So. Um, you know, working with uh, working with programs um, to be able to build up that infrastructure. Um, uh, one of the best practices that Dr. Gable and I recommend in our report, uh, particularly for Indigenous communities, is sourcing that locally from um, Indigenous service providers, if possible. Um, uh, but uh, also one of the things that we're offering, I, just, I wasn't expecting to do this, but I'm just going to give us a little plug here. Uh, Dr. Gable uh, and I have received a, a COVID grant. Um, so we are looking to um, work with and sponsor um, First Nations communities. We are community engaged researchers, which means that we work with the community to come to a determination on what is going to work for the community and what is going to add value to the community. We are not researchers coming in telling you this is our project and this is what we're doing. We co-create this together, but we have resources to be able to support um, voting or some kind of digital dialogue, like um, a chief and council meeting or something. And so, you know, if any if any of you members participating or you know of any communities who would be interested in this, I would encourage you to to reach out because we have the the funds to be able to support that, and we could walk them through. Um, the digital literacy piece and, and, and support them with that. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll leave that there and uh, give you my contact information um, if, uh, if we could help in that regard. Um, but I mean, another way uh, is, you know, working with people like us to um, help us uh, to do educational training in the community to boost digital capacity. Uh, you know, one way, Mr. Jacobson, that communities have sort of helped with that if they, is they created um kiosks in public places. I mean, this might be harder during COVID, but in a community center, for example, where they would train people as deputy returning officers, and they would be able to help facilitate people using that technology. Some people voted online, and that was the first time they've ever used like the internet for the first time. Um, but having someone there, not to advi advise them on their voting, but just to walk them through that experience um, was, was, was really, really great. Um, and then in terms of a uh, code per person, so how you decide to vote is going to be very different. It's going to depend on the needs of your community uh, and what you want. Some communities, um, it will be a, too much of a barrier to have all of these different bells and whistles for some kind of small vote. Um, and, you know, they're going to need a certain approach. Well, other communities may want all the bells and whistles. And uh, so it really depends um, you know, the, the cultural uniqueness of the community, uh, what your needs are, the nature of the vote, um, other contextual considerations such as like, what is the digital literacy of the community? Is it really strong? How engaged are people? What kind of infrastructure do you have? All of those types and more that I'm leaving out variables are really going to influence the approach that's right, that's right for you. Great. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Goodman. Uh, uh, Mr. Jacobson, any other questions? Thanks. No, thank you, Mr. Chair, not at this time. Thank you, Dr. Goodman, for your report. Thanks. Thanks, uh, uh, Mr. Jacobson. Uh, some great questions there. Um, I know that we have uh, Mr. Simpson on the, the phone as well. Um, do you have any questions, uh, Rocky? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess more of a comment than, than a question. Uh, First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Goodman uh, for the presentation. It was uh, very informative. Uh, one thing I guess uh, I would like to see is, uh, I guess for the committee, is that I'm in I guess I'm interested in hearing a presentation more about the, uh, the potential impact of online voting in, in our small, remote, indigenous communities. Uh, Northwest Territories, you know, we've only got 40-plus uh, thousand people here. So uh, any uh, error could... Uh, uh, could be magnified. So uh, you had mentioned uh, Dr. G Dr. Gable, I think it was, and I'm not sure if uh, we can, uh, you know, uh, uh, solicit a, a presentation uh, from her uh, uh, for the committee at, at some point in time. Uh, that's about all I have to say. So thank you. Thanks, uh, Mr. Simpson. I don't know, uh, Dr. Goodman. We might put you on the spot here, but. 
um, knowing that the Northwest Territories is about 44,000 people spread out over a third of uh, Canada. It's kind of like a, a very small municipal uh, uh, municipality in Ontario. Uh, um, and you know, we we heard about uh, difficulties with internet access here. Uh, any um, observations, suggestions about how we can make uh, e-voting work better here or observations about a period? And I think that's what uh, uh, Mr. Simpson w was getting at, but uh, any, any comments would be appreciated. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Uh, great. So, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the thank you to the member for the for the question. Um, I'm I'm sure if the committee had the time, um, that Dr. Gable would be more than happy to to make herself available. Um, her and I have a sort of a co presentation that we do where we talk about First Nations recommendations, uh, and I, I could have spoke to that a little bit today, but to, to be honest with you, I just felt it better that um, that some of that presentation needs to come from an Indigenous scholar themselves, um, not just me, you know, telling you imparting the information. And Dr. Gable is an exceptional Indigenous scholar, and so I think uh, I think you'd really learn a lot. Um, from the from the presentation, uh, but in terms of, of tips, you know, I would be happy to provide um, some tips in terms of implementation and you know what might work for you. Um, giving a little bit more information about the context. So how are you thinking of implementing this, the nature of the vote? Um, you know, are you making this available again for absentee voters only? Or maybe now with COVID, you're considering making it available to a special subgroup of electors um, that have, you know, health, health uh, immunocompromised persons that you don't want to be exposed or, or whatever. And I'd be happy to provide advice on what might be the best plan of implementation for you um, if you're amenable to it. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Dr. Goodman. We, we may take you up on that offer. We may. Uh, I know that uh, Dr. Gable was on our uh, stakeholder list that that we sent out as well. But we may uh, make some extra efforts there to uh, try to get a hold of her as well. Um, I uh, just going back to my list, uh, Mr. Thompson. Do you have any uh, questions? Uh, other questions you'd like to ask? Please go ahead. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, first of all, um, yeah, I'd like to thank uh, Emily Jackson or Jacobson for bringing up the issue about um, the limited uh, accessibility of internet in smaller, some of the smaller communities. Um, so I guess my, I'm not going to ask that question because I think uh, Jackie asked that question uh, nicely. Um, my, one of the questions I have is on slide nine, um, and again, it just has municipal treatments, you know, uh, and First Nation treatment and no treatment. Um, could she explain what she means by treatment on that slide? And I apologize if it was explained before. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mr. Thompson. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Goodman, the question on Number uh, slide number nine. Thanks. Yes. Uh, sorry, sorry about that. I probably should have taken that out. So basically, um, when you're looking at this statistically, um, or, or like in any type of study, if a group has the treatment, it means they have had the condition or something or the internet voting, right? So um, the treatment group means that they had internet voting and the control group means that they didn't have internet voting. Um, just like if you were doing like a medical study, you would, if you wanted to test a drug, you would give the, the treatment group the drug and the other group the placebo, right? Does that make sense? Sorry, I will, I'll change that for next time. I'm glad you made that point, thank you. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Yeah, that uh, certainly makes it uh, clear. Uh, Mr. Thompson, any, any other questions? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I realize in the time and that, so I'll just have my last question. Um, and if we have any follow-up, I'll work with the committee to send written questions to Dr. Goodman. Um, my question is, she talked about with COVID-19 and the directive you know, this may be the option of us moving forward, um, especially in 2022, considering if you listen to the 
the Chief Public Health Officer of Canada, she's saying you know, we're looking at 2022 before we come through that. However, when you talked about it and you said, yeah, we, we can't jump in feet first because of the limitations we have into the services availability. So how can we actually jump into it? Um, considering we don't have the capability uh, presently and yeah, you know, we're 2020 right now, but we're in the fall and basically we're talking two years and some of the challenges we see, I don't know if they're going to be fixed. So have you thought about that uh, moving forward? Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Thompson. Uh, Dr. Goodman, please go ahead. Thank you to the chair and uh, and thank you to the member for, for the question. Uh, excellent, excellent question. Um, yes, okay, so all hope is not lost, of course. There's lots that we can do. Um, so one is to leverage knowledge from other jurisdictions and networks within Canada without. There has been a ton of online voting research that has been conducted in Canada by other organizations, Elections Ontario, Elections BC, Elections Canada. Uh, at the municipal level, the town of Markham, for example, has been doing a, you know, a lot of research. I find that a lot of election agencies and governments seem to undertake these large research projects, but they work in silence. So they amass all these research, this research, but they're not actually talking to one another. I realize, you know, there are provincial um, election groups, so you do do some talking, but generally um, I find there's not enough information sharing or not sufficient information sharing like there could be. So one is leveraging those resources, finding a way to reach out to your networks to get that information um, so that you don't have to replicate it, right? And you can build upon it as opposed to starting from the bottom. Um, a second uh, item is working with academics. So, you know, um, working with individuals like Dr. Essex and myself, Dr. Gable. Uh, I mean, if you would like to be uh, part of this standards process, so be like a, a fly on the wall and be part of it and listening and want to know the standards that are coming out so you can consider those for your future elections so you can have those protections, uh, you know, we're more than happy to involve you in that. Alex, if you're watching, I hope that's okay. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm sure it's fine. Um, and same thing with the with the project uh, that Dr. Gable and I have, you know, if, if we can support a First Nation community to, you know, help increase their digital literacy and if we can take the guesswork out of implementing an online election for you, you know, we're happy to do that. We have the, we have the project funds and we have the expertise and the capacity. So, um, I, for, for, so first, I would say getting information from jurisdictions, getting information from academics. Um, a third item is really upping the IT infrastructure of uh, the election of the Northwest elections, Northwest Territories. Um, you know, if that's possible, um, bringing some more people in, or maybe contracting some people. Um, you know, maybe even getting some. Um, computer scientists or software engineers who are academics who who would be willing to you know do a research project if the funds aren't there but thinking creatively about how to develop solutions and bring the expertise in house so that you can put yourself in the best position possible you know often in life we're never 100% ready um, but I would say if you're going to use the technology that I would caution you not to eliminate paper voting at this time because uh, I just don't think we're ready for it thank you Great. Uh, thanks very much. Um, anything else, Mr. Thompson? I know that I think uh, Mr. Norm might have uh, another question or two, and I'm just looking at the time. I know uh, it's uh, uh, getting on with uh, the committee meeting, but uh, anything else, Mr. Thompson? No, um, I will turn the floor over to yourself and Emily Norm. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, Mr. Norn. any further questions? I think that was a no, but uh, I think you were uh, muted. Uh, um, anything further? No? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. No, nothing further. Okay, great. Uh, thanks. Um, I had a, f a number of questions, but I think they were covered by some of the uh, uh, our other uh, committee members. And, uh, um, yeah, I really want to thank you very much uh, today, Dr. Goodman, for uh, spending uh, 
uh, time with us. Uh, we really appreciate that the presentation that you put together and all the research that you've done on this. Uh, uh, you've obviously studied this very carefully uh, around the world, and uh, I think you're a great resource. And uh, uh, we would look forward to, um, we may be in touch with you if we have any points that we wish to clarify, but if you have any additional observations, recommendations on uh, e-voting uh, here in the Northwest Territories, I, I understand that um, you haven't really had a, a, a chance to look at uh, perhaps the our chief electoral officer's report on the last election where she did uh, report some of the uh, statistics and findings around e-voting. I think generally uh, there was a higher hope that we would get more people participating uh, through that channel of uh, 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 voting, but it doesn't seem to have uh, panned out as well as people had anticipated. But if you have any additional thoughts, observations on that, we would really welcome them. Um, and of course, I'd like to apologize to everybody, uh, including Dr. Goodman, for the technical di difficulties that we had uh, earlier uh, in the uh, meeting, getting the uh, the presentation up and going. Uh, I know we had a chance to look at it, and there's lots more information in there, uh, and we really appreciate that. So uh, I'll just go back to Dr. Goodman with any uh, closing thoughts, comments, uh, before we uh, go into the in-camera portion of our meeting. Uh, but thanks very much for your time today. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you to uh, yourself, Mr. Chair, and to all the members and to uh, and to the clerk uh, for doing so much work to uh, facilitate this and you know bring me to, to chat with you today. And I apologize for the t for the technical issue, but I'm glad that we were able to speak and, and get everything underway and give you sort of the key key sound bites that you need to to move forward. Um, I will definitely review that report with interest, and I'm happy to report back to to Michael if he's the um, perfect uh, point of contact. Um, with some some recommendations, um, the, my only like recommendations moving forward would be that you know yes consider online voting particularly given the current circumstances. Don't eliminate paper voting. Um, work on you know developing your infrastructure and strengthening your networks to leverage as much resources and knowledge as you can to put yourself in the best place possible, and um, do that research and make those investments um, now and continue to do so. Some of the best cases in Estonia, for example, they have refined their program election after election, and that is what has made it what it is today uh, and made it very, very evolved. So, I mean, the Northwest Territories could be a leader um, in Canada in terms of the subnational elections, and there's really an opportunity, a unique opportunity for leadership there. Um, and you're in a you're poised in a, in a good position to, to take charge there. Thank you. Great. Uh, uh, once again, I, on behalf of the committee members, I'd really like to thank you for your for your time today. Um, and uh, uh, we wish you a, a, a speedy recovery uh, with uh, your uh, uh, brain injury there, uh, and that. Uh, uh, that you uh, can continue to offer us great uh, advice and recommendations moving forward. And uh, we wish you all the best with your, your studies. Uh, you've got some great work underway here. So, again, thanks very much for, for appearing with, uh, before us today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thanks. Am I okay to sign off then? Yep. Thanks. Thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, uh, committee members, um, I guess uh, we will uh, need a, uh, a motion to, uh, sorry, this concludes the, the, the public uh, portion of our meeting. I'd like to get a motion to move in camera where we can consider uh, Dr. Goodman's uh, submission to us and, and a few items moving forward. So if I could get a motion to go in camera. Mr. Norn, thank you. Uh, motion's in order. Any objections from anyone? Not seeing any, motion's carried, so we will uh, now uh, move to the in-camera portion of our meeting. I want to thank uh, the public for watching as well, and we're going to just uh, take a, a brief pause here to uh, disconnect our system. Thanks, and uh, committee members, please stay with us. Thanks. <laughs>